Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our weekly webinar on Ram Brown's um, conversation on change for leadership. Uh, my name is Sam Alamayo. I'm with, with my partner and fellow board of trustee on the Ram Brown Scholars, uh, Meredith Akers. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, today, we are super, super excited. Uh, we have a fantastic um, set of um, panelists and, and special guests for you today. Um, I just want to start quickly with an introduction of the Ram Brown Scholars. The Ram Brown Scholarship is a scholarship as well as mentorship program uh, that selects uh, 20 um, to 25 scholars every year out of uh, 6,000 to 10,000 applicants and provide them with uh, a $40,000 scholarship, but also a lifelong mentorship and guidance. Uh, but it also has a program and guided pathway uh, services that it empowers high school juniors and seniors uh, to be able to channel the right way, uh, to be able to have the mentorship that they require um, in order to succeed in the college application process. Um, and today uh, I'm coming in as a 2004 scholar, as well as a board of trustee, uh, to take this moment where we are seeing an incredible amount of change through COVID, as well as social awakeness and um, understanding with the murder of George Floyd. Uh, there are many incidents that are happening within our community and, and we wanted to continue to pro provide a platform for candid discussions and um, access to leaders whom we admire uh, to be able to discuss their mind. Um, without further ado, I wanted to welcome our today's guests. Um, we have Crystal Boyd, uh, who's a 2006 scholar, um, a writer. Oh, 2006, 06, right? 06. 06. 06. 04. Who's a writer and, um, and an actress um, that has uh, appeared in, in the very, very powerful Downtown Girls, as well as uh, Black Girl Magic, um, Caleb Franklin. Um, who is uh, an agent uh, who opened TA's office in India and currently running um, his own talent agency as well as production company out of India. Uh, 2001 scholar, um, old timer. <laughs> uh, and Patrick Baker, uh, who is uh, a board of trustee on the Ram Brown Scholar alongside myself, Meredith. Um, and, um, and I have everybody's bio on, on the website, so I'm not going in detail for everybody, who is, um, who's worked in Hollywood both as a producer um, and in various capacities uh, doing both documentaries as well as future length movies. And we have the one and only Samuel L. Jackson, the legend himself, whom we are incredibly grateful uh, to be with us. And without further ado, I will start with Sam Jackson. Thank you so much for making the time, my fellow Sam. Um, I wanted to start with a question for you, where in this um, time of incredible change, everybody's saying COVID is going to be this great reset. Uh, a lot of things are going to start in a big way. And the thing about resets is it could be an opportunity to bring about uh, new ways, but, but the same stuff could uh, be repackaged again and come back. Um, so what, what are you feeling in this moment? Um, and, and you have seen it over the past 50 years of, uh, civil rights and, and activism. Um, what is your feeling right now and what is your message on leadership? Oh, uh, geez, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm sitting at home watching and um, uh, asking questions. I mean, I have a daughter who's, you know, of another generation, so I can ask her about who's this and who's that and what's going on and who's that person that's leading this part of the movement or who's that, because there is no like one like national figure that people can look at and go, oh, that's the Dr. King of the day, or that's the uh, uh, Rap Brown of right now. You know, there are no figureheads that I can look at or I can ask her about that she can just identify and say, well, that person is this part of the movement and that person is this part of the movement. So I'm not really sure what's going on, but I'm energized by it and watching it. And uh, it gives me a reason to read a lot more and to make a lot more inquiries and have different kinds of conversations with people that I'm in touch with about what's going on out there uh, and trying to figure out where I need to 
um, use my influence or my resources to help people achieve what that particular goal is they want to achieve. So I'm on the learning end of what's going on out there because, you know, the young people just grabbed hold of this and ran. Uh, and I was shocked, you know, because I hear all these stories about who, who, who's not connected and who doesn't care. And uh, these kids have, a, have this attitude or that attitude. But what they showed me is there is a unity of purpose that's uh, worldwide. It's not just, you know, a national thing. It's a worldwide thing that uh, the energy of the young people uh, is hungry for change uh, and they want it to happen. And I know like we did when we were young, we want it to happen now. Uh, and we didn't understand, or we understood that was a process, but we figured that was a shortcut. You know, there's a way to, to bypass this or bypass that, to jumpstart what we want to happen so that we can make it start happening now. But um, that's, that, that's gonna be the difficult part, you, you know, the, the patience and understanding of the process. Uh, and once again, we start talking about things that like when I was young, sounded old fashioned, you know, like going to vote and do this. And it still sounds that way when you say it. Okay, it's important that we vote, that we get this done, that we get that done. Uh, and like we kept saying, or they, we, we, we learned that if voting was not a revolutionary act, then they wouldn't keep us from trying to do it. So we need to understand that particular aspect of what we need to get done and identify those uh, young people who have the ideas and the wherewithal to go out there and implement those ideas for the people that want them done uh, so that they can start to run for office and be those people that uh, are our agents of change. Well, absolutely, absolutely. No, that, that's wonderful. And, and just kind of piggybacking on that, what is kind of in your mind the role of media to bring about kind of social and racial equality? <laughs> <laughs> The role of media to bring about social and racial equality. Um, I, I, I have no idea, um, you know, because there's, there's just stuff. Um, and when you say media, we're not talking about just news. We're just talking about the idea of how the world works and what happens. Well, in media, um, that's not particularly difficult these days. Uh, for people to tell their stories because it's 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 all of a sudden okay to tell stories about different cultures and everybody's life experience in another way. Uh, it's okay to tell it from you know the female perspective. It's okay to tell it from the LGBTQ perspective. It's okay to tell those stories uh, and people understand them because they were raised with a mixture of all those people. You know, it's it's it's, it's like. When I first got in, you know, the movies and TV and all that stuff, you know, I always opened the page to find out where I died. You know, where am I going to die? Or what, 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 what kind of criminal will I be this time? You know, and then all of a sudden I did my first law and order, my first law and order, and I was actually a lawyer. You know, it's like, oh wow, I'm not, I'm not going to die. I'm, I'm not a criminal. So these kids are going to school with all kinds of people, and they have friends who are doctors, they have friends who are lawyers, they have friends who are accountants. You know the the milieu of what their lives have been is a lot richer than what our lives were. See, I grew up in segregation. So when I was a kid, I knew black people and I didn't know white people. I didn't have any white teachers until I got to college. I didn't go to school with any white kids. I was not educated by any white people. And my own my only interaction with people of the dominant culture was when I went downtown. And that was guarded. Because, you know, I could die. I grew up in segregated Tennessee, so I didn't have like a real fluid interracial upbringing. So my upbringing was black and kind of safe in the cocoon of that blackness that people told me the things I needed to know. And there were people, older people in my life at that time who weren't that far removed from slavery. You know, their parents were actually slaves. Like my grandmother's mom was a slave my grandfather's father and people were slaves. So they talked to me about things that they got talked to about that let me see a different kind of America or understanding of what, what society was through their eyes. 
So until I got in the world, I didn't have like a real worldview. I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't go to Europe until I was, said I was almost 40. You know, 1980 was my first trip out of the United States, you know, uh, and I was well, one in 48. Yeah, I was almost, you know, 40 years old. So I didn't know what the world was and the world didn't open up to me in that way, aside from me reading, watching television, going to movies and wanting to go places. So I had a desire to see the world and be in it and ex ex experience it on my own terms. So it was a while before that happened. And right now, media is able to explore, you know, lives of people in different countries. Um, the diaspora of the world is huge in the media right now. So people find out that we live in this situation, but our, our desires and goals for our children and our lives are kind of, kind of a common goal. You know, hunger is hunger here and there. Um, the politics of trying to make a living and make a life uh, that every parent dreams of doing something that makes their kids' lives better. Uh, and we see that that's a universal thing. You know, it's not just something that, you know, you have to be in a certain uh, uh, strata uh, to want those particular things. We all want that. That's, 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 that's what our goals are, to make sure that the next generation has it easier or better than we have it. Um, so media uh, is able to explore our, our sameness more than our differentness, if that's a way of saying it, you know. And I like looking at it that way, that, 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 that we are more alike than people want to believe. And the more we believe that and embrace that, the more we're going to, you know, get along, which is why this whole movement has been so great to look around the world and see as many people in the streets of Germany as in the streets of DC or Atlanta or Australia or wherever people were out supporting Black Lives Matter. Because no matter where you are, I mean, everybody's got a form of a Black life that needs to matter, <laughs> which is really crazy. That's one of the things I found out when I finally got in the world. And, oh, wherever there's, there's uh, dark people, there's some kind of discrimination going on. Uh, and, you know, those lives never mattered as much as the other lives. So all of a sudden, the world is beginning to realize that's not a unique problem to us just because we were brought here in a specific uh, way to do a specific job and make a country great uh, and don't get credit for it, but continually uh, try to be held down. That's not just an American uh, phenomenon. Uh, absolutely. That, that's, that is wonderful. Uh, just piggybacking from that, Crystal, kind of you, you embody kind of this idea of kind of the new generation being able to tell your story in your own terms. And that's what you've done with Downtown Girls right out of kind of your dorm room. Can you tell more about kind of the power of being able to own your own story um, and being able to navigate that in Hollywood? For sure. Um, first of all, I just wanted to bring into the space since we are still fighting today. Um, say her name, Brianna Taylor. Say his name, Elijah McClain. That was just two or three days ago. And the names continue. So let's remember that this is still ongoing every single day, right? So for me, um, first of all, talking about Gen Z, um, I know my mom is on this call, and I know my sister, Ariana, the best Gen Zer in the world is on this call. So, hey, Bo. Um, anyway, um, I just wanted to say, um, yeah, so creating my own narrative, um, I am one third incredible trio of Black women called Downtown Girls. We're like a comedy collective, and we learned the hard way that we had to make our own lane because we were graduating from NYU. Alec Baldwin was the keynote speaker, and he told the entire room of Madison Square Garden of Tishies, you are all going to be stars. And we were like, okay, like I received that, right? Um, but, you know, the, not everyone can be stars, guys. And uh, three years later, we realized the hard way when I was trekking down Broadway streets, going out for slave woman number two with my Negro spiritual, um, that this wasn't it. You know what I'm saying? So I I do my own thing here. Um, so we just started telling stories that looks like exactly what we were doing. Um, I think one of the most liberating things I learned and my friends Chandra and Amebit learned 
where that we could use our personal life. There is no one to wait for. There is no one to tell me what type of story I need to tell. We wanted black women, splashy, fun, like very, all we fall flat on our face. We make mistakes, um, you know, and back in even 2011 to now, like we've seen so much growth, but so much more growth has to happen. I mean, I, f I feel like when I saw Girls Trip, I was like, finally, like, this is happening. Like the world is seeing how funny we are. We're funny. Like I want to see some crazy stuff, you know, like I want to see black women getting peed on, you know, no offense, you know, just let's go, let's go big. But, um, anyway, you so that in BAPS? BAPS, but look, how long, how many movies do we have to get to there? Sam? So, that was like 1992. I don't need one big splashy movie every 20 years. Every I want 20 to years. Come on now. Every 20 years. So we, it's much. time. It's over. Okay, so that being said, um, you know, we learned to just tell our own story. And when I tell you that the universe opened up to us the minute we decided to step into our own lane and not wait um, and to essentially take control of the narrative of what we want to see, it was like the world responded and said, how can we support you in that, right? And I think we are entering a time where execs no like we got we got the sauce like you know black people we need to tell our stories um and we in this day and age we are now positioned to be the leaders of what the world not only needs to look like but where we need to go from here because everybody is looking around to their right and their left i have white friends asking me what do we do now right we hold the answers as a, you know a lot of us as black creatives not to tell white people what to do because i'm tired of that but like you know just more like knowing what we need because we've been we've known this whole time um was that the question the Issa Rae oh. model worked for you guys the Issa, the Issa Rae model yes yeah. shout out to Issa yes absolutely absolutely fellow Stanford fellow Stanford grad yes. um Caleb I want to come to you kind of you know Sam had alluded to it how kind of this Black Lives Movement has gone international and and you are in India and, and you have seen kind of the power of kind of Bollywood, the power of Bollywood, but also this movement and how media and those that are involved in media, what are you thinking and, and, and what, how are you feeling about in, in this time? You know, I, I, I remember I read this book, um, Sapiens by Yuval Nora Harari. And the thing that struck me about that book is he said that human beings are different than any other species because we have myth and we have stories that, you know, unite us, stories that dictate how we live. And I think, you know, the cool thing about what we, we get paid to do is that we're myth makers. You know, we tell stories that define, for better or worse, how the world operates. And, you know, when I think about the fact that there was a Black Lives Matter march in Mumbai, I can't help but think that the fact that, you know, you have Captain Nick Fury fighting uh, aliens, uh, you know, with a, a teammate of people of all races has to wake the world up to say, well, maybe the myth of, of, of how we thought the world was isn't true. And I think a lot of our power is in, and, and I'll say on my side as an agent and a producer and the person who's reading the screenplays and giving the notes, is to be a curator of those myths and to really have an agenda around the myths that we want uh, the future to be centered around. You know, um, one of the things I've, I've been struggling with and thinking about is, you know, I'll go back, you know, we were talking about Germany earlier. You know, if you're in Germany, nobody has any problems with Germans. But if you say Nazis, people automatically in Germany go, oh, that's not, that's not who we want to be anymore, right? You know, there's no Nazi statues in Berlin. Um, right. Because the mythology is, that was a mistake, right? And I think we've got to get to a place where white supremacy is a mythology that was wrong, right? <laughs> not nuance, is not, hey, you know, let's have Good a with discussion that. about it. Yeah, and, but this is really the big, the big thing. This is the big issue that, you know, there's good people on both sides. You know, <laughs> that, that is what, no, that is what not. we need to do. That's the, we're the myth makers here. So I uh, think that's a power that we have. And, you know, it's not going to happen overnight, but, you know, if we read a screenplay and there's a white supremacist character that 
has no arc and no redemption and it's not shown as that this was problematic at all somebody's got to raise their hand and say uh this brother's racist you know like that's not acceptable and i think the young people today no longer want to live in a world uh where white supremacy is nuanced um and i think that's exciting mm. that depends on what part of the country you're living in doesn't it and age. Do we, do we accept that still? I I I I feel like I feel like look, it's not gonna be perfect, but I, I do believe very strongly that people are ready to accept that narrative if we're willing to tell it. Mm -hmm. So why does it feel different now? Well, you know, I, 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 I'll tell you, you know, we used to sit in, in rooms and uh, Patrick, who uh, is amazing and is, by the way, I know you're, he's going to talk later. Patrick's been one of my mentors and one of the reasons I'm in this business. So it's so great to see him. But, you know, I, I remember we, we had coffee one day and we talked about being in rooms and people saying, oh, you know, it's a black comedy. Black comedies don't travel. Uh, and that was a big thing. You would never, ever be able to get the budget for a comedy movie with African Americans in it because, oh, that won't play well in, in uh, you know, Korea or India. And then you look at Jumanji and you got to say, wait, what is that? And I think people are now unpacking uh, these narratives. And I think, you know, it's the, the development executives, um, the agents, we have to have an agenda around this. We have to have an agenda. Yeah, but The Rock is like the non-blackest black guy on the planet. <laughs> well, you talking about Kevin Hart? Now. I mean, yes, yes, he's black, he's black, but, but the world doesn't look at The Rock and go, oh yeah, that brother there. They, they just go, The Rock. He is just The Rock. Kevin Hart's the black element. He might not even be the same race as The Rock. You know, the Rock is like, The Rock is his own race. You know? So we can't, we can't use that example. However, I do feel like to that point, you know, I know someone is going to talk down the line about the green lighting rooms and all of that, but it's like these, that's, we need green lighting rooms that reflect everybody on the ground because it's so funny how these execs get shocked when like huge hits starring black people, like, like um, even Will Smith, when, um, when Bad Boys came back out just this year, like people get stunned every time it's like a huge success. Like they're like, oh my God, how did that happen? You know? And it's just like, it's, it, you just don't know who's, who's, who, what this country is right now. We're not, we don't make, we're not the makeup of your boardroom. And that's why we need to change what the boardroom looks like. And how much did that movie make? How much did that movie make? Yeah. I'll add a little bit to that, Crystal, because as a former um, studio-based production executive, one of the great things about Hollywood is that Hollywood gets to create and um, imagine and inspire globally. And, um, and, and in that role, Hollywood has um, still managed to keep a certain anti-blackness. And, um, and, and so what's really critically important now at this juncture is that, is that we, start to, we start to do a better job of attracting and recruiting and retaining um, black people to be agents because the talent agencies are the they're the they're the sort of central nervous system of the business the business in hollywood is basically like a big dysfunctional high school of cliques right and and so but if you go into those cliques very rarely do you see black people or any people of color and so right now i think suddenly hollywood's like oh my god let's put together a task force on diversity and, um, and while that's good and promising, there's still severe systemic institutionalized racism going on at agencies and in boardrooms. There are not enough um, black leaders, much less black executives, because the boardrooms have the green light power. These green light jobs are, are largely determined by white people who run marketing departments, who value a movie globally. Right? And too often black movies have limited budgets, bad marketing efforts, because there's, there's this notion that there's, there's no way you can make money with a black movie overseas. 
So, so what we need now more than ever is we need people of color to own their voices and to own their own narrative and come to Hollywood and say, this is my voice, much like Crystal has, as she continues to struggle her way up to becoming a, a star. And that's what's critical here in media and in Hollywood. Well, there's this other thing too. I remember when um, I first, you know, got noticed in Hollywood uh, and they were saying the same things even then. Um, and I realized that when they offered me an opportunity to take a junket, when I went to London to do a junket, or I went to Paris to do a junket, or when I went to Berlin to do a junket, if I was there and I appeared on the talk shows of those particular countries and, you know, spoke about the fact that I was, you know, really excited about being there and excited, you know, that people were discovering who I was and da 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 all of a sudden, I had a greater appeal because I showed up and I was there to, to talk about it and to be in it and to be of that particular culture in that particular moment and actually meet the people that did my voice. I actually used to know the, the, the person that, you know, dubbed my voice in German or dubbed my voice in French or dubbed my voice in Italian because those people begin to identify that voice as yours. And those people became like my friends, uh, which was interesting. And, and they were happy because I work a lot. <laughs> so they were so they were working. And, and consequently, you know, I became sort of an international name more than I might have if I hadn't had the opportunity to do those junkets or hadn't taken the time to go to those countries and find out what it was they were looking for or what they thought I was or how they were going to relate to me in a specific way. Um, and I think those things are very important also, that just because there's a streaming service now, people don't, you know, junk it. They don't go out there and people don't get to see those people. Or Crystal, they haven't seen you as Crystal. You know, you haven't been in a room sitting, uh, talking to the late night talk show host in this particular country or that particular country or doing some stupid game thing in uh, Tokyo. That, that's what people do. But people have to see that you're an ordinary person and that you're fun and that you're more than just a person who acts or you are more than, than, than just that particular character who's in that film that has you know, a life that has an interest in their particular culture, which is what they want to see. Mm -hmm. They want to know that you are there and you are trying to absorb as much as you can about what's going on there so that you will better be able to do something that relates to them next time they see you. You know, um, you know, I think Kayla should have you over there doing like a Bollywood movie, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Come on. I mean, they make, how many, how many films do they make there every year? They make I don't know. We make the largest right? amount of films in the, in the world a year. Yeah. And there you go. And you are willing to go to Mumbai and work, right, Crystal? Yes. Yes. And there Let's you do it. It's happening. All right, done. I'll even do. I know, I perfected the fake kiss. You know, I know they don't kiss in the go. movie. Fine. No, no. Oh, yeah. you can go to Nollywood. You, yeah, you can go to Nollywood and be in a Nigerian movie. <laughs> we're, we're open to going wherever. Yeah, always That's open. Okay. I've been trying to do a you know a, a, a kung fu movie forever. Now I'm too old. <laughs> I still want to do a Chinese movie. I'm I there. Somebody I agree with you. I agree with you. And right. you know, also about you know when people tell stories internationally about America to include black narratives and stories in it. I mean, we just did a film for Netflix called Ye Ballet about two boys from the slums in Bombay, true life story, who went on to join the Royal uh, School of Ballet. And mm -hmm. it did well on Netflix, Reed Hastings talked about it. But in that movie, we made sure to include Misty Copeland, uh, mm -hmm. directed by a wonderful woman named Suni Tarkorvala who wrote Mississippi Masala. But for those boys to say, I wanna be a ballet dancer because Misty Copeland is a ballet dancer. Um, it was just so powerful. And so I think it's a, it's a cross-cultural dialogue, but it's important for us to have executives and agents and storytellers and writers, you know, integrated in these places. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm mad okay. At <laughs> Sorry. Conversation. Okay. So, so, All right, nice. Coming in, guys. Sorry. <laughs> Lots and lots of questions for everybody on the panel regarding, and I'm just going to sort of put it in a bucket because we've gotten this question many times. 
guidance and direction for young black actors, young black directors, anybody who wants to be in the industry, what should they do right now? What, what's, a, what's a good thing to take an opportunity right now? Well, I'll say this, especially to my black women, shout out everybody who's a black woman watching right now. Um, uh, it depends on what tier of in, in the business you're at, but regardless, I think across the board right now is a time to be still and to listen and to position yourself. Because what's happening is that the world, it's almost like you know, the Red Sea is parting and people are like, oh my God, black women exist. You know, like it's truly, you know, people are acting across the board, black people, you know, execs are acting like, oh my God, black people? Like the fact that Band-Aid after 200 years came out with enough skin tones for everybody, late as hell, right? You know, I think this is your time <laughs> to look around and for your team, or if you don't have a team yet, look around and pitch yourself to the team because they're looking, they're looking. And I would charge white execs and white people watching and allies and everybody, this is your time to do the work. You need to get really uncomfortable and start sharing black creatives and especially black women and especially dark skinned black women because colorism is a whole nother thing, right? So like, let's share and pass on this flow of information while people are paying attention. And you know, I hope this isn't just a ellipsis. I hope this is a, a movement that becomes stronger and stronger, but capitalize on where we are right now. People are asking white, powerful people, even though, you know, we got to use them, we got to work with them, you know, they're asking who is out there. So, you know, wrangle your people and, and if they don't get it, then drop them. Like, it's just, it's too important. The moment is too important right now. Um, I don't, that wasn't so much for a starting out person, but create your own narrative, create your own narrative, write your own stuff, shoot your own stuff. Everybody got an iPhone. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. There's a lot of stuff going on right now. Everybody's got, you know, things that are coursing through their, you know, minds and their veins in uh, different ways. You know, chronicle your experience right now and see if you can turn that into something that informs and entertains and and advances the cause um it, this is the time like you said uh to have that to have that narrative um i remember you know years ago when it was difficult you know to to i didn't have an agent forever you know it took me a long a long long time to get an agent uh and i used to you know when people ask that uh, question how do i get this how do i get to there how do i get to there i would always say you know go to new york do some theater like, can't do that anymore that's done, you know? So I don't know what's gonna happen or what's the training ground. How do you do that now? Um, media, you know, multimedia may be the answer for, you know, the next five years until they can find a way to comfortably put people in Broadway seats or get people, actors onto a stage and, and uh, working together in a safe environment, who knows? Um, but you do have friends who, uh, who write, who direct, uh, if you have ideas, sit down with those people, brainstorm with those people, uh, Zoom with them. Uh, you know, people are going to do Zoom scripts, you know, write whatever needs to be written. I did a great television show just a couple of weeks ago. Um, I think it's called Staged with uh, the brilliant actors from London. That's a huge hit over there. You know? And it was just a Zoom TV show about some guys doing a play and somebody might do it, might not do it. And I just stuck in there as a guest shot. And it's, you know, a huge hit. So things are working in various and sundry ways to make things happen. You know, who knows what or how long uh, uh, um, 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 the five bloods would have hung around waiting. You know, I got like three movies that aren't going to be released until next year because they're waiting and hoping that movie theater is going to open back up. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they will or not. And, you know, it, it's one of those things. Things have changed drastically. And uh, how the business works is going to change drastically. But the one thing that's not going to change is people who are in rooms green lighting things and saying that, you know, we're going to do this. We're going to put money behind that. We're going to do this and that and the other. Um, but there is still that outlet of you putting your own things out there and starting online somewhere. Um, wow. I was just asking about um, uh, some good news, you know, <laughs> last week. I remember doing that. And all of a sudden, you know, he's, he's uh, sold it now and it's a, you know, commercial property. But in the beginning, it was, it was, you know, a way to do something 
because everybody was so depressed about, you know, being in the house and coronavirus. So all of a sudden it was like, okay, well, I'm doing this thing called good news. Would you do something for me? Sure. Okay. And I did it. And now it's, you know, now, 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 now commercial property. So things happen that way. And that's how things happen in this environment. Granted, it ain't a black thing, but it's a thing, you know, and it happened. Um, so we just gotta, as usual, creatives need to continue to be creative, you know, um, and use whatever feelings you have to create something that, you know, like-minded people or people who feel the way you feel will watch and maybe feel better or understand why they feel a, a, a particular way. That's what we're for. That's what artists do. We sometimes explain why we feel a certain way or explain why the world is a specific way or explain how you can get out of a particular feeling and into something else. Uh, we are, you know, agents of change in that particular way. I may not be an agent of political change or, or, or that change, but I can help you change your attitude. That's what I'm here for. And I hope that's, 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 that's what people do when they engage something that I'm a part of, that they're looking to feel a certain way or find a way to get away from something. Because, I mean, I don't do social messages often. You know, I do entertainment. And I hope I entertain people because that's what I've always wanted to do. I want people to, you know, be able to escape the drudgery of what's going on around them like I used to do when I went to the movies. I went to the movies to forget about being a little black boy in a place where I couldn't go everywhere I wanted to go. You know, but I could use my mind to escape and go anywhere I needed to be in that particular moment, you know, aside from reading a book or, you know, that other thing. But I went to the movies to escape the drudgery of what my life was. Uh, and I'm still, you know, trying to help people do that. Wow. Awesome. And again, I'll so. just, and I'll just, if I may, comment on the need again for more Caleb Franklin's. We need, if you're considering going to law school, agencies, you know, typically today comprise, are comprised of 80% of the agents seems to, seem to be lawyers now. So we need, if you go to law school or not, we need people to come to be a part of these institutions who, who are so desperately need more people of color in green light power positions. So to that, to that question, Patrick and Caleb, and we've got a lot of this question, just like the one I just asked, so I'm going to paraphrase it. On that side, on the green lighting side, on the gatekeeping side, what are some, what are some pathways? How does someone who doesn't have that background or know anybody in the industry start to make that pathway for themselves? Caleb? Go well, I, I, Patrick, I'm going to throw it to you. I mean, you were part of my path, so. <laughs> I mean, again, it's strict. Hollywood is, is very much a, a place of nepotism, unfortunately. Um, it's sort of like who you know, you gotta network and um, you, you gotta try to use everyone you can to get you on a set as a gaffer, as a hairstylist, whoever's gonna get you any job you can get for no money, unfortunately, you gotta kind of take it and build your network and, um, and stay true to your voice and who you are. And, um, and that's really, really critical, but there are, there are agencies that have um, training programs that um, there are, believe it or not, there are um, what are called assistant board jobs. You can go online and you can go into and find assistant jobs working on the desks of agents. Um, there are floating positions at studios that are always looking for readers to read scripts. So um, I'm, I'm, you're really starting at the bottom, but it's really critical to get in any way you can, including using your grandmother or your best friend or Sam Jackson for appearing on this today. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I agree with that. And, you know, I got to say, and this is big props to, you know, Patrick, but also the entire Ron Brown Scholar program. I mean, winning that scholarship allowed me to go work in the mailroom at CAA for basically no money. Um, and, you know, to take that ego hit of coming out of Harvard University and, you, you know, putting apples and putting envelopes in mailboxes and delivering letters and pretty much doing anything and everything menial. Um, but what, what you do get from it is a, a huge training on how this business works. And I think Patrick's totally right. It is cliquish. It is a, a very chaotic high school. But I think programs like the Ron Brown Scholar Program 
will allow you to do things just like this because you're not coming out with so much debt. And that was a real blessing that I got from it. And then to Patrick's point, you know, go online, apply. I mean, I got turned down by like 12 companies before I got into, into the eventual company. I worked for free as a script reader for eight months. So, you know, really your passion and at the end of the day, hard work is, is what comes of it. But at the end of it, you know, you, you do have the ability, you know, for whatever it's worth to change the narrative. And I think that that's, that's a really cool opportunity. I have a question. How come you never tried to poach your brother? What happened? <laughs> Bollywood. We didn't <laughs> run into, oh, or you, or you escaped before you tried to poach me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have a question for, for you both, since you are in that lane, Caleb and Patrick. What can the execs and the people in those rooms, the white people with the power, right? I don't want to just talk about what black people can do to work hard to get there. I'm not, no, no quotes, because that also matters. But yeah. what can we do from those rooms to put pressure on new pipelines? It always cracks me up that, you know, people that don't understand affirmative action say oh my gosh you guys get everything and it's like well nepotism is the original affirmative action so how do we break down some of these pipelines of nepotism and how how do people hold themselves accountable that yeah i want my i want my son in this but also what can i do to make sure a dope talented black person can also get in the room yeah um i mean honestly uh, I've gotten calls from friends who are agents across all the major agencies. And sadly, we've been talking about diversity at the agency, as Patrick knows, for the last 10, 15 years. It took a bunch of passionate people getting out in the streets to wake people up to say, if my boardroom is entirely not representative of the world, uh, I've got to change it. And you're starting to see those changes. So, you know, I'd like to say, uh, Crystal, that we had a, a sort of a magic ball that we could pressure people on. I think it's movements like now, it's taking the opening that we have and getting as many people to apply and setting as many meetings and getting you in as many rooms as we can. Um, that's what it's going to be. Um, because, you know, internally, we'll, you'll have your diversity initiatives, you're having your training programs, but really it's just going to be very talented people standing outside that door saying, if you don't let me in, it's worse off for you. And I think that that's, you know, really what's going to push the needle. Patrick, tell me if I'm wrong. You're absolutely right. And I don't want to um, forget the unions and, um, and the guilds. Um, these are very important places that um, have forgotten the, the sort of intersectional needs, the intersectional needs of, of people of color. And it's really important that um, we understand that this business is not just the, the you know, the movie stars and the, the CEOs and the powerful agents. It's, it's the below the line people. It's the people yeah. who, who are making the movies, the crew, the, the people who are on sets. Um, everyone has a role in doing the best they can to no longer be a passive bystander and to do everything they can to, you know, hire that person of color to to figure out what role we're gonna play going forward. It's still systemic, it's still institutionalized. It's, it's just, um, you know, the moment has come frankly for, for white people to have this discussion with other white people. Yeah. Um, and, to, and to really engage, and really engage in that sort of uncomfortable conversation um, without shaming um, and certainly without creating uh, this, this sort of, um, separation but we just have to do that and and hopefully it's all starting now again mm. how long have we been trying to do that you know what i'm I saying I, uh, I remember back when jesus when i was getting ready to do a uh, negotiator uh you had me and you had gary gray and all of a sudden it's like well we we got to get somebody white or it's a black movie you know uh mm -hmm. and you know they got kevin spacey which was supposed to be like, you know, a meter mover, but come on. Things like that happen. If you got too many black people, all of a sudden the movie becomes black. You know, if the lead is black, the director is black, uh, the costumer is black, we gotta get somebody that's big and white, 
so that people don't realize or, or people don't don't think we're we're making a black movie. You know, mm-hmm. and that is still the idea. I don't care what happens around it. You can look at Get Out and people will say, well, that's a black movie, right? I mean, it's a lot of white people in it, but people, most people identify that as a black movie, wouldn't they? Wouldn't you think? Definitely. Okay. Maybe not. Maybe I'm wrong. But <laughs> things like that go on all the time. The more black people that work on a film changes the the melanin quality and, and quantitativeness of that particular artistic endeavor. You know, you can't have too many black people on it or it's just black, you know? Right. How many movies have, would you say you've been in, Sam, where you're the one black person on a white cast? A lot of them. How many? A lot. I know you have had 150 plus films. <laughs> All the men's <laughs> black movies. <laughs> a bunch of them. A bunch of them. You know, but yeah. you know that's just the nature of the business. But uh, it's 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 one of those things where I didn't. I went out of my way specifically. I I I consistently told my agents when I when I first got them or when they got me because <laughs> they came and found me. I couldn't find an agent. They came and found me, uh, <laughs> and all of a sudden it was like we can get you into this that, and the other. And I'm like, well, I don't want to do roles that are specifically written for black people. So just send me a script, let me read it, and I'll tell you which, which person in there appeals to me. You mm. put me in the room with those people and I'll see if I can get that job. Wow. You know, no matter what they say they want to see me for, I don't like that role, I like this one. Can I talk to them about this? So, you, so I had an opportunity to make that decision, to make that choice when that finally happened because that's a lot harder than the audition process. Mm-hmm. You know, the audition process was, okay, I go to seven auditions a week, I expect to book one to two of those jobs, and it doesn't matter what that job is. When you have an opportunity to make decisions about what you're going to do next, to make sure you continue to work, then you have to find things that showcase you uh, in a specific way or that lets people know, I am not just this kind of actor. You know, yeah. even though I can read my, you know, lines on, on our Twitter or whatever that people talk about, well, I seem to do the same movie over and over and over and over again. <laughs> uh, but, you know, thank God it's been lucrative. That's good. Uh, but <laughs> I don't think that, but it's, it's, it's imperative at a certain point when you get to a certain point, it's a lot harder to choose projects that keep you working so that you're not, you know, hit or miss. Because I never thought that I had, you know, three chances to fail. I never thought that I could <laughs> fuck up upward. You know, I can only go down. So that's just not how it works. So it's a lot more difficult to do that. But that's a, that's a, you know, that's, that's a bullshit Hollywood problem for me. You know, <laughs> finding something that keeps me working that people will continue to, to pay their money to see me and do, to, to see me do. But being in that machine and having people around you that can help you navigate those things is very important. Um, I had a very supportive crew. Um, they're women, mostly, you know, mostly women, you know, fuel, fuel my, you know, creative life. Um, and they fight battles for me and they enjoy doing it uh, because they're generally fighting against, you know, white men who think they're strong and they like to beat them down. And that's fine with me because I don't have to do it. <laughs> they get to do it. Uh, and they're the bad guys, but they're good at being the bad guys, and that's fine. Um, but the point being, I've, I've, I've often asked those same questions about, well, who's the person that's going to say that this movie gets done? You know, it's like things that you discover that you didn't know before. It's like the first time I had to go to um, a meeting with the star of a movie because he had cast approval. I had no idea what that was. You know, that I had to go in a room with somebody and they had to look at me and talk to me and see if I could eat with, with, with a fork or could conjugate or was pleasant enough that they wanted to spend six weeks with me. You know, fortunately, that guy was Harrison Ford and he did. You know? <laughs> so I got to I got to move up another rung on the ladder, you know, but it happened again and again with a couple of other people where I had to meet these people to see if I could actually be in the movie with this movie star who was going to say yay or nay to the fact that I could be in that movie. And I'm sure the same thing happens with boardrooms when people try to get 
you know, folks to come in there that's going to be um, running a studio or or the next person that's, that's uh, going to do things. I mean, I mean, I've heard the you know you'll you'll never work in this town again line <laughs> <laughs> from someone. So it it, it still happens, um, and it's it it was an old boys network for a long time. Um, and that was the nature of how this business worked. It's changed some, but not that much. Plus now, you know, people aren't really creative. They're like bean counters saying, okay, the metrics of, of, of this particular storyline have not worked, you know, to the extent that we want to make another movie like this. You know, no matter what the story is or how good the characters are or what it means to someone who might watch it, it's, it's, it's all about the numbers and the money and where you're going to shoot it, how long you're going to take to shoot it, how much it costs, you know, above the line and below the line. Um, it's, a, it's a very different business. Things aren't as star-driven as they were when I first got here. They're event-driven now. Um, I've done a lot of event movies, so I kind of know what that means. Uh, being a member of the Marvel Universe and, and the Star Wars franchise and Jurassic Park. So I've I've been on a few franchises that have nothing to do with the people that are in them. It's all about the thing. No, I'm, and, and I want to bring in uh, one of the Brown Brown scholars who wanted to ask a uh, direct question to uh, Sam Jackson. Hey, Jason, can you go ahead? Jason Brown, who's a sophomore at um, Brown University. Uh, hello, everyone, um, and thanks again for sharing some time with the community. Uh, it's always refreshing to know that industry leaders are eager to give back in any way that they can. Um, so as he said, my name is Jason Brown, and my question is for Mr. Jackson. Jackson. Uh, so you were a pioneer for racial equality in an unlikely form of media, Japanese animation, when you helped create the first black anime, Afro Samurai, in 20, uh, 2009. During that time, what were the steps you took to bring such a revolutionary work to life and how could Ron Brown scholars replicate this leadership in other forms of media? Oh, um, that was the first one? Really? See, that yeah. I didn't know. I just <laughs> assumed it was, you know, a typical, you know, piece of uh, work that happened. Uh, actually, um, that came to me through, um, the creator, uh, Bob, uh, his name is Takashi Okazaki. Uh, he found me. Uh, he somehow got the project together. He had a, a sizzle reel. He'd already, you know, put some hip hop music to it. And he got the project to me because I have this, I had this, still do uh, love of Asian cinema. And it was widely known at the time um, that I collected Asian cinema. Uh, and I've uh, since, there's a, there is a black anime company now in uh, Tokyo um, that uh, these young brothers are running. Uh, it's dark, uh, what's his name? I can't, I, I can't pronounce his name. Diart, yeah. Diart Shatayo, Shatayo, it's H-T-A-J-I-O. Um, but wanting to do something that, that's, that's different and hopefully, like I say, interesting to an audience that wants to receive it, uh, sometimes they don't know until you get it and you get it out there. Uh, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was very fortunate that um, I guess my celebrity allowed um, the network to say to themselves, well, we can spend this much money on it. We're not gonna spend a bunch of money on it, but we can spend this much money on it. And I pretty much just volunteered my services in an interesting sort of way because I wanted it out there. I wanted it to be out there. I wanted it uh, to be something that was very different that was uh, showing us in another light that gave an opportunity to uh, specifically show a future because every time I saw something about the future, 
uh, we didn't seem to be around too much. Uh, and in this dystopian future uh, of Japan that had this brother in it just walking around with this dope sword and this big afro and uh, being all cool was something that I figured we needed because we weren't part of the science fiction landscape mm-hmm. or the future seemed to be whatever happened in the future was probably COVID-19 because it killed all the black folk. You know, they weren't around. So I wanted to make sure we were around when people looked at something like that or that they knew that, you know, like everything else, we're very resonant people. We hang around and we're still around. And it was done in a very cool format and um, with some very cool people around it that um, made me feel like I was actually doing something that was wanted and necessary. And it's so bizarre that when I look online now, people still talk about Afro Samurai like it's still there, or where is it, when's it coming back, or are you ever gonna do the live action version of it? Um, There is a need for people to understand that we are part of the future. We're not just part of the past. We uh, tell a lot of stories about us being elements of the past, but only in a specific time frame. You know, every now and then, you know, you'll look up and you'll see um, a black person on a pirate ship or, you know, or you'll look up and you'll, you'll uh, see, uh, what was that I was watching? I was like, something with some black folks in Scotland. I was like, what the hell is this? Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, so stuff like that happens, but I'm always looking or, 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 or thinking that we have to continually make sure we are part of the conversation because nobody else is going to do that. We have to be the ones that make sure we're a part of that conversation. We have to be the ones to put ourselves out there and to let people know that we are part of this particular genre. We are, we are part of that genre. We are, we, are, we are capable of speaking this way. We're capable of speaking this way. We are capable of doing any and everything that anybody on the planet is capable of doing. So it's incumbent upon us to make sure that happens because nobody else is going to make it happen. Amen Hopefully to I that. answered that question. That's awesome. So we are running up on the hour, and we had so many questions that we did not get to answer. So uh, what we're going to try to do is I've got a copy of all the questions that were answered in the chat and the Q&A, and we'll try to get them to the right folks. And hopefully, um, Crystal and Caleb, and, and maybe Mr. Jackson and Patrick will willingly respond to those on an individualized basis. We'll try to get those answers back out to you all. But I, I just wanna say on behalf of everyone, thank you so much for the time today. It was incredible. The feedback we're getting is just incredible. And um, truly thank you for taking the time to share your- Awesome. Thank your, you. Your thank you them. guys. Uh, Crystal, Caleb, I'm gonna see you guys on set in Mumbai. Right. All right, let's do it. Bollywood movie. Look, we need black people in India. It's going to happen. Done. <laughs> I'd love to see Sam Jackson in a Bollywood movie. Hey, man. <laughs> oh. All right, y'all. All right, guys. Thank you so much. You Thank you. That was so much Bye. fun. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Fuck yeah. I know.